in theory you can tell a story about anything no matter how grim or controversial the subject matter but whether or not that story or a particular beat in that story is good depends entirely on how deft a storyteller you are there's this stubbornly held belief that in order to make a story more grown up that sex and violence are the means with which to do it and if you want to tell a realistic fantasy story you're going to want to include this is definitely because we want this fantasy world to match the real life history of planet earth that all of us know the fine details of for some reason and not because it's how the weirdos writing it get their kicks but i digress you wouldn't expect so much of this kind of content in a t-rated game but warcraft kind of skates by because it's an mmo and digging through 10 plus years of content to find the things that could reasonably push it to be labeled m kind of slip under the radar now this is not me saying think of the children or some other wafer thin concern i think in some ways that wow story would benefit if it wasn't actually restricted to a t on the other hand, I don't trust a single writer currently working on the WoW team to not just turn it into a Game of Thrones ripoff, because even restricted by the rating, there is a surprising amount of SA in the lore. And before you come at me in the comments all, but Morgan, it's called Warcraft, not World of Carecraft. War is ugly. You're right. War is ugly. But if we're going to have this as a plot point, the story damn well better do its homework and follow through. Because if it just throws the trauma in there and doesn't follow the survivor working through the messy, difficult process of healing from it, you aren't here for grit or realism. You're just here for trauma porn. So I've split these instances into four categories. Clear cases. These are cut and dry examples where there's little to no wiggle room on what happened here. Implied cases. These are examples that are a little more ambiguous, but the suggestion is definitely there. Edge cases. It may not be explicit, but the vibes are absolutely rancid. Dishonorable mention. Just one, but it's worth bringing up. With that out of the way, let's start with the most obvious ones. For anyone who is blissfully unaware, Alexstrasza was held captive by the Dragonmoor Orcs of the Old Horde alongside her prime consort Tyrannostras. She was kept chained and magically weakened, and the rest of her flight was kept in line for fear of her death. The Dragonmoor forced Tyrannostras to breed with her so she would lay eggs and provide them with war mounts. It's noted that this gruelling, years-long experience hastened his eventual death, as he was already ancient by the time of the Second War. Any time her children proved to be too weak or too willful, they were slaughtered, and those who could be broken and forced to serve lived a life of fear, misery, and hatred, as the dragons who were meant to safeguard life were made to senselessly destroy it. The story has never adequately addressed the effect this had on Alexstrasza, and the closest they came to demonstrating the crushing weight this put on her was in the book Day of the Dragon. When she was freed by Verissa and Ronin's efforts, and the Aspects had their powers restored, Alexstrasza drove Deathwing away by projecting the emotional and psychological pain she carried as the result of her experience. Deathwing fled the battle, senseless and wailing, because a destructive, seething, and malevolent vessel for the Old God's will was unable to bear the weight of what Alexstrasza was put through. I don't need them to go into sordid detail of her daily life during that time. That isn't the important part. The important part is allowing this compassionate, life-loving, motherly figure to be angry, to be prickly and cold, to have mixed feelings about remaining or future consorts and the mere notion of being a mother again, struggling to connect with both newly hatched young and existing children because she feels she failed them for years and doesn't have the right to be affectionate or friendly. 
A prolonged experience like that would give anyone CPTSD, otherwise known as Complex Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. It's distinct from standard PTSD in that it adds a host of other issues, including a distorted sense of self, dysregulation of emotions, and dissociative disorders leading to possible amnesia, feeling outside of yourself, and feeling the world around you isn't real. Not to mention the physiological effects of long-term chronic trauma, because not to state the obvious, but trauma is stressful, and we know that chronic stress can absolutely wreck the body. That trauma, especially when it keeps happening, physically rewires the brain. Alex Strasser was in that situation for years. In the right hands, there was potential for a lot of good, fulfilling story about Alexstrasza reclaiming her life. There still could be, but she isn't in good hands, and I think the team knows they do not have the range to address it, because for the most part, they have steered well clear of ever touching that part of Alexstrasza's backstory. Which is just as well, because given their current track record of traumatized female characters, the most likely result of them doing so would either be turning her into an out-of-control vengeful woman who needs to be killed or subdued, or a passive good girl who smiles serenely when Bane asks her how she feels about orcs during a war crime tribunal where her experience was brought up. Oh wait. Christy Golden, turn on location, I just want to talk. Loran was Murad's sister, and the very much unwilling mother of Garona, brutalized by orcs after being taken captive. You know how we could have gotten something out of this in a way that mattered? A quest with Garona where she visits the site of her mother's grave or some equivalent, and performs a drainic rite of cleansing that she's done every year since she regained her freedom. There are a lot of complex emotions tied up in being the product of violence, which would only be worsened by Garona's own traumas as a brainwashed assassin of Gul'dan, literally forced to grow up so she could be used as a weapon. Let her have a moment of quiet reprieve, time to use her hands for something gentle rather than violent, to revere and mend, and to try and find some scrap of inner peace. Half orcs and half Draenei in general are almost universally framed as having happened through orc aggression against Draenei, which, again, the problem here is the hyper focus on the trauma itself and the tragedy surrounding it, not the survivor, if there even is one, not the journey afterwards. Focus on the stories of survivors and children created by those events. Let them feel how they're going to feel and let them build their own lives, find their own peace after the violence. It's not pretty, but that's just what happens in war. And what about after the war? When wounds need binding and houses rebuilt? Or are you just here for the thrill? In the Badlands, we help the red dragon Reistraza to capture the black dragon Nixondra. Once captured, Nixondra is experimented on and forced to lay eggs so that Rhea can find a way to cleanse them of the old god's corruption. Seeing as the dragon maw needed Tyranistraz for Alexstrasza to lay eggs, it seems fairly clear that dragons can't reproduce through parthenogenesis, which is the act of laying unfertilized eggs that still develop into offspring that are essentially genetic clones of the mother. Which leaves the question, who exactly was Rhea getting to force himself on Nixondra? Another black dragon? A red dragon? I hate this mystery, but Blizzard fully wrote this situation and gave it the green light, so blame them. This is an instance where I am 100% okay with Blizzard retconning it out and never mentioning it again. A red dragon, a female one at that, doing what was done to her queen to another female dragon was so monumentally lacking in awareness that it defies logic. There were so many ways you could have gotten to Rathian existing, a hidden cache of uncorrupted eggs, stolen eggs that get cleansed, a secret group of cleansed black dragons who have been in hiding all this time, and out of all the possibilities, they chose forced breeding done by one female character to another.
A female red dragon who helps you fight against the blue dragonflight in Northrend, Kerastraza is captured by Malagos explicitly to replace his slain consort, and let me just read the exact wording here. Malagos abused her constantly, branding runes into her body and using his powerful magic to bend her will until she finally went insane. And the writers decided the best way to end that story was to have her allies mercy kill her, instead of the red dragons doing everything they could to save her and let her heal from this wretched ordeal. They even wrote her begging the players to finish it in a moment of horrible lucidity. I hate it here. A daughter of Malagos, Kiragosa is a blue dragon character from the book Twilight of the Aspects. She was captured by the Twilight's hammer, whereupon her unhatched eggs were experimented on, and she was to be forcibly impregnated by Chromatus, a five-headed chromatic monstrosity. She was chosen because Chromatus reasoned the child of an aspect would be able to survive the process, with the heavy implication there that at least one woman has already been brutalized to death by him. I am begging for less forced dragon breeding going forward, Blizzard. It's starting to look like a fetish at this point. Thankfully leaving the dragons alone for now, if you weren't aware, the Mokhnathal were created by the Ogres of Draenor after raiding, experimenting on, and forcibly breeding with orcs to produce a cast of shock troops and slave workers. The origin itself is not the main problem for me, but the lack of exploration of what kind of impact that would have on the Mokhnathal as a culture makes it feel hollow, like it's just there for the sake of being edgy and grim. Speaking of being edgy and grim... No, the RPG is not considered canon, but the fact that the concept of harpies kidnapping males of other species to forcibly breed with them got in there at all is still getting a raised eyebrow all the same. The human woman who helped Thrall escape enslavement, and of whom Lord Blackmore forced to become his unwilling mistress, leaving mysterious bruises on her wrists and ordering her to the bedchambers of male guests to please them. She eventually has her head cut off by a drunken Blackmoor, who then throws it over the wall to upset Thrall. I shouldn't need to explain how disgusting that is. In the Dark Riders comic, Aridhel is a posthumous character and the wife of Archmage Carlane. While in Karazhan, Carlane's son sees a corrupted vision of Aridhel cheating on Carlane with a younger man, whereupon he murdered them both in a rage. The truth is actually that the younger man attempted to Aridhel, and in anger and desperation to save her, Carlane brought half the house down, killing both the man and his wife. Just... why? Why did you choose to write this? She could have just died in childbirth, as irritating as that is to see over and over again in worlds where magical healing exists, but at least it wouldn't just be throwing wife in there and oh boohoo, he's so sad. His wife only exists to get threatened with and die. Atrocious. Zero out of ten to see me after class. Syntharia was Neltharion's prime consort before he became Deathwing, and after he was consumed by corruption, he attempted to mate with his consorts. The power tearing his body apart killed all but one of his consorts during the act, Syntharia. The violence of that event left her with permanently burning scars like brands on her body, leading to constant pain for the rest of her natural life and a bone-deep hatred of Deathwing in the aftermath. She started to despise her own name and identity so much that she began to go by Lady Sinestra at all times, and ultimately broke away from the Black Dragonflight to create one that had nothing to do with Deathwing and would only be a product of her, as if trying to excise every trace of him from her life. It is not hard to read into. Hello, Editing Morgan here. I just wanted to add that, uh... After she was defeated in Grimbatal, Deathwing took her corpse, reanimated her with the power of the old gods, into an obedient tool for the cult, the Twilight's Hammer, and 
continued to have her produce eggs that would be turned into twilight dragons, meaning this broken husk with only a sliver of her former personality who was doing everything in her power to erase all trace of Deathwing's existence from her life is reduced to an egg factory with no control of her own. Have they changed it since then to make it less of an almighty yikes? Yes, they have. Did it only get changed after the lawsuit came out, thus drawing stark attention to some of the more surface-level but still questionable things in WoW? Also yes. Is it kind of funny in a laugh-to-keep-from-crying way that when Blizzard was redeeming Illidan for Legion, they blamed the presence of the then-unchanged Pleasure Dungeon to be the fault of the Blood Elves serving him, even though he had to have given them approval to set that up in his fortress, but somehow that totally absolves him of any untoward activity going on? Yep. On the subject of Blizzard trying to redeem Illidan, however... So, Wolfheart is a terrible book, and I'd be perfectly happy if they yeeted everything that happened out of canon, which they sort of did when they had Maiev and her brother meet up in Legion, and he glossed over the whole thing. But at one point in the story, her brother Jarrod is talking to Malfurion and Tyrande about what happened to Maiev while she was held captive by Illidan, and before this point, it could be safely assumed that there was some kind of torture and general mistreatment because he hated and feared her after being her captive for 10,000 years. However, the way Malfurion and Tyrande dance around explicitly telling Jarrod what happened, and the way Maiev later phrases what happened as being at Illidan's tender mercies, leaves far too much room for the implication that Illidan assaulted her. And then the story goes on to make her a crazy serial killer with no nuance in all of the megalomania. Love that for her. I already touched on this in a video I made earlier this year that made a bunch of very normal people very angry. Here's the short version. The various ways Sylvanas' death and subjugation by Arthas has been told and retold over the years, paired with both his overwhelming spite and cruelty to her after she resisted him in life, sneeringly calling her woman right before running her through, and her rage and struggle to regain agency in the aftermath, resulted in a lot of people seeing her as an allegory for survivors. This means she would have been an edge case here until the Sylvanas book implied things were being done to her body without her consent when Arthas was still puppeteering her spirit around like a trophy. Only for Blizzard to then turn around and make the violating stomach injury into that nothing scratch on her collarbone because Blizzard is run by cowards who don't have the range. An NPC human woman in the Undercity, and the mind slave of a forsaken man called Gerard Abernathy. Yes, they changed it so her title is Gerard's Experiment rather than his mind slave, but we still have a woman who has been abducted, parts of her brain removed, and others stimulated to create a completely subservient woman with no bodily autonomy or free thought of her own, paraded around by a man who has complete physical and mental control over her. F***ing horrifying. Not to mention that the way he talks about her and shows her off to the others, including the line, as good as I told you it would be, yes? The implications of which make me want to molt until all of my old skin has been replaced just to feel clean again. You're probably thinking, no, surely not, or this has to be a reach. Maybe, but we're on the edge here. This is because we're told through the artifact lore book for Warlocks that after the War of the Ancients, Sargeras had a vision where he was pulled down into Azeroth's core and saw the world soul herself. In that moment, she opened her eye and looked at him, and he was immediately enraptured. Afterwards, Sargeras was no longer obsessed with destroying Azeroth's world soul, but in corrupting her, and his conception of that future regarded her as, quote, corrupted, demonic, and most importantly, his. 
I know Sargeras is the big bad evil of the universe, but we really could have just left it at he's destroying her because he views her as a potential threat if the Void gets to her, and not violent omnicidal man wants to own and brainwash pretty woman who looked at him once. It was completely unnecessary to add that. There's only one entry, and it's that originally, Murad and Yurel were meant to be lovers who lost their respective universe counterparts, and for Murad, that meant during the Draenei genocide that Yurel was killed and defiled by orcs. You know, on top of his sister Loran already suffering that fate, and I am extremely glad they cut this. Look, I know this was a rough one, it's not a fun topic, and the handling of it in Warcraft has been less than stellar, to put it nicely, but at no point do I mean to say that we cannot tell stories about dark and painful things. What I'm getting at is the way survivors are portrayed, and if they're even the focus of the story being told. Is the survivor the focal point, or are they sacrificed like a lamb so the actual protagonists who have not gone through it can have some heroic motivation? If it's the second, you could use almost any other motivation and the story would be functionally the same. Sibling murdered, village burned down, priceless family heirloom stolen, spouse kidnapped, literally anything else. But why can't we focus on the people around them? Their friends and family are hurt by it too. They are hurt. But theirs doesn't take priority over the survivor who actually experienced the trauma. Loved ones might hate seeing the survivor like that, and they would want to do something about what happened, but the way they feel about the situation doesn't get to override how the survivor feels about it. It's their experience, their body, their pain, and they should be heard before anyone else. This will be my last video of 2022, but I'll continue working on Netherstorm and hopefully get it out in January. Thank you for watching, and special shoutouts to my patrons who are all very handsome people. I hope you all enjoy whatever festivities you celebrate as the year closes, and I especially hope you take extra good care of yourself if this time of year is not so good for you. Don't forget to drink your water, take your medication, and I will see you next time in 2023.